welcome to this week's episode of the Good Ram Show with me, Chris Goodram. As per usual, a big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode of the show, liked, commented, all that kind of stuff. Um, your continued support is very, very much appreciated. Um, and also, as per usual, uh, any comments that I do make on today's episode of the show are wholly my own and have no bearing or relevance to the company that employs me. Just thought I'd better get that one out of the way. Um, right, okay, so uh, this week, um, it call me a, a sort of a cynical old whiskey taster, but um, I often find there's not a lot that really, really gets me excited, it has to be said. Whiskey wise, um, head out of the gutter, please. Um, you know, it's kind of like, I mean, what, what's gone on recently? Um, lots of hoo ha about this new blended whiskey created by Jensen Button. I mean, you know, um, I, don't, I don't doubt that Jensen Button is really, really into his whiskey, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's just, it's yet another. Another sort of celebrity endorsed brand, isn't it? It's a bit like sort of David Beckham's aftershave whiskey, isn't it? <sighs> Yeah, and and then you have stuff like um, this the, the the most recent release in the collaboration between Bamor and um, Austin uh, Austin Martin. I mean, you know, the, the the I mean, if you've seen the bottle, I mean, the bottle is absolutely beautiful. It is gorgeous. It is a work of art. It is stunning. Am I really that interested? No. Am I ever going to get the opportunity to taste it? No. I mean, is it, <coughs> excuse me, stupidly priced? Probably. I mean, you know, it just doesn't really interest me. Um, I mean, in saying that, of course, obviously we, you know, I, I tasted the, um, uh, the Spanish whiskies, uh, Haran, um, a couple of weeks ago. Now, they really quite excited me. And to be fair, I got an email from um, a chap called Paul Dempsey, who I used to know from his time at Speyside Distillers, said, I'm now working for this new company called Brave New Spirits. Here's our, our, uh, our list. Uh, are you interested? And I took one look at it and went, ooh, no, mm, that looks exciting. Um, yeah, OK, you know, anything to do with mythology, you know, sort of Norse and... Uh, Viking, Egyptian, anything gothic, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it really, it ticks my boxes, you know, I mean, I'm a bit of a sucker for that kind of stuff. But after I thought that and thought, wow, I love those labels, they are really cool. Um, my second thought immediately was, is this a question of style over substance? Of course, that we will find out, because at the end of the day, it's all about the juice in the bottle, so we will get on to the juice in the bottle and we will find out whether indeed the, uh, the it is all, um, well, it, maybe it isn't style over substance, but we will obviously find that out. Anyway, um, a little bit of information about uh, the company. So like I said, this is, this is a brand uh, created by a company called Brave New Spirits who are founded by two chaps, uh, one called Alex, uh, no surname given, um, who apparently co-owned a small independent bottling company in Germany called Scotch Universe, and he ran that on a part-time basis. Uh, the other chap uh, who um, uh, owns uh, Brave New Spirits is a chap called Adam, again, no surname given, um, who formerly worked for um, uh, ACA EO Murray McDavid, and I think you will notice that the Murray McDavid influence is quite apt. Um, anyway, so if you take a, a look at their website, obviously the link is in the uh, the box below. You'll see that it is um, what the it's all very uh, Richard Branson, Virgin, boutiquey whiskey, brew doggy sort of we're funky kind of guys kind of thing, you know. And um, I'll be honest that that. That kind of marketing really doesn't kind of appeal to me. It's like, like you know, you get an email from Virgin with that sort of matey kind of bonhomie, you know, um, just to tell you that your bloody broadband is going up again. No, I'm not that interested. And no, I'm not your bloody mate. You're a faceless corporation, you know. Um, I mean, call me an old git, but, you know, it's like that doesn't really, you know, 
appeal to me. Now, in saying that, um, I can understand that it does appeal to a lot of people. If it didn't, people like um, Brewdog and Virgin and Murray McDavid, which is where I think all of this has actually stemmed from, wouldn't be using this kind of uh, approach, this kind of marketing, this sort of matey uh, kind of we're funky guys kind of stuff, you know. Um, and like I said, at the end of the day, I can ignore that kind of noise. Yes, it doesn't really appeal to me very much, um, but what's important to me, and if I'm going to get behind these kind of whiskies, is, you know, because, I'll be honest with you, uh, there is, uh, you know, these haven't just been sent to me just to do an episode of the show, although, um, you know, I'm sure the advertising will, will come in um, come in useful, um, assuming, of course, I say nice things, that is. There is obviously a financial angle for the company that I work for and whether I, the company that I work for would stock said bottlings. Um, so, as we all know, the juice in the bottle has to basically live up to... Um, all the other fluff, uh, so to speak. So um, anyway, like I said, this, uh, this is the first. This is the Voodoo Ris Vis uh, Duck. I can't even put my teeth in. The Voodoo Whiskey Range now are all um, small batch bottlings uh, from the same distillery. Uh, they haven't stated the name of the distillery on the labels of each of the uh, the, the, the particular bottlings. Um, and I did ask whether that was down to the fact that when they purchased said cast there was the caveat that they couldn't do it or whether it was something they chose to do and it was the latter. I think what they wanted to do was kind of um, put more emphasis on the brand, for want of a better word, you know. Um, and that's all well and good. Obviously, I know what distilleries each of these come from, uh, so I can impart that information. Um, but the thing is that it's kind of like a lot of these kind of brands that have been been created by independent bottling companies. It allows them a bit of flexibility with regards to what actually goes into the bottle. If they can't get the same kind of stuff, then they'll use something different. One um, piece of advice I would give the guys at Brave New Spirits is that when you do come to look at doing batch number two, I would keep the flavour profile of each of these if you do a second batch in of these uh, particular labels keep keep the flavor profile as close as possible I mean the thing is from a customer standpoint you buy a, a bottle of say the rusty cauldron or the dancing cultist for example great names um, and you like those bottlings you're going to want to buy batch number two and you're going to expect at least a similar kind of flavor profile you might not worry that the distillery is exactly the same and there may well be obviously batch variation but you know you bought batch number one because you liked what you tasted so therefore you know you want the same thing in batch number two you know or there or thereabouts um so that's just my little uh, my tuppence worth shall we say for the guys at um brave new spirits so um anyway i think that's um that's enough kind of uh, <laughs> cynicism um and uh, because i really want to get on and uh, and and show you these whiskies so let's take a look at today's lineup right. oh incidentally um <laughs> Just to mention that basically if you do pop over to their website and have a look at what they do, you'll see they do a myriad of different bottlings. They do an awful lot. Um, I, I, one gets the feeling that an awful lot of money got spent on this enterprise uh, where that came from. Uh, I, who knows? Um, but they do an awful lot. They also do another range, mainly, uh, they do obviously the Voodoo range, Whiskey range, but they also do a range called the Rebels. Now, I do have some samples of that particular range or a part of that range, which I'll be looking at next week. So um, I think that's going to be quite interesting. But anyway, um, we're talking Voodoo uh, this week. So bottling number one we're looking at is called The Coven of Destruction. I mean, I love the labels. I mean, whoever is the artist for these labels, I mean, um, you, you might be able to see them a bit clear, more clearly on the, the, the title page or, like I said, go and have a look at the website. Whoever is the artist behind there, they are really, really good. So um, The Coven of Destruction is a single lowland grain 13 years old, bottled at 57.8. Like I said, it's a batch. It's from Cameron Brig, 
and it's been aged in first fill red wine casks as you can see lovely color um, and we will see uh, what we get from that bottling number two is called the mask of death this is a space eyed single malt aged for 10 years bottled at 51 percent batch one is dal Yuan, and it's been aged in virgin oak and first fill bourbon barrels so yep looking forward to that one uh, bottling number three, the nailed puppet. I mean, you know, <laughs> great. Name. I mean, I did say to the guys, uh, or to, to Paul when we were having an email conversation, um, that there was an obvious, uh, which I'm not going to say, uh, name that had not been used. And uh, I said, you know, I could come up with a million and one different names for these kind of releases. Uh, this is the sort of thing that I would have come up with, to be honest with you. But unfortunately, I didn't. Anyway, um, where were we? Oh, yeah. Um, Number three. Uh, number three is uh, the Nailed Puppet. Uh, this is a space eyed single malt aged for 11 years uh, and bottled at 52.6%. It is indeed Tormor uh, aged in first and second fill bourbon barrels. So, you know, not all about uh, weird and wonderful wine casks. Um, Bottling number four, uh, this is the Dancing Cultist. Uh, this is a 12 year old Highland single malt, uh, bottled at 50.5%, and batch one is Blair Athol, aged in first fill red wine casks. The penultimate bottling is called The Bloody Sacrifice. Let's hope it doesn't taste like one. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a blended Isla malt, aged for 10 years um, and bottled at 49.1%. Batch one is Williamson, and for those of you who know, don't know what Williamson is, it's teaspoon Lafroy, and it's been aged in first fill Amarone Bariques. Again, I get this impression that some of these have probably been sourced from Murray McDavid, or if not from Murray McDavid, from the, the broker that uh, Murray McDavid has a tendency to use. Um, and the final bottling of the day is the Rusty Cauldron, and this is an Isla single malt aged for 11 years, bottled at 54%, and it is Kalila aged in refill sherry butts and first fill Lafitte wine casks. Um, so, yeah, I think this looks like a really interesting uh, lineup. As I said, I just love the labelling, love the concept. I mean, you know. Um, really looking forward to tasting them but at the end of the day as i said it's the juice in the bottle that counts and we're now going to find out what the juice is like right, okay so kicking off with the coven of destruction so 13 year old cameron brig aged in uh, first fill wine casks okay the wine cast notes are actually pretty subtle um I'm getting more of that um, classic sort of grainy dried fruits, uh, a little bit of sultana, dried apple. I mean, I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the the finishing cask is definitely there. It's very subtle. It's almost non-existent in reality, um, but it's yeah, I'm relatively well balanced. I mean. It's not particularly complex. It's a 13-year-old grain whiskey. Um, now, it has an RRP of 47.95, which is fair, I think. I mean, a lot of people might go, 47.95 for a 13-year-old grain? Well, it, it smells like 13-year-old grain whiskey. Um, it's, yeah, not amazingly complex, um, but it's got more interest than if it had just been purely aged in American oak because as we well know you know it just wouldn't have had enough time in the cast to really pick up any any kind of characteristics but it's picked up a bit of whininess Let's see what that's like I see alcohol on the finish. Good intensity, lovely, grainy, um, grain whiskey character. Again, the, the, the finishing cask is a little bit more noticeable, it's a bit more obvious. Um, balance is pretty good. Um, I like the interplay between the dried fruits, both the winey fruits and the, um, uh, the, the column still dried fruits. Again, it's, a, it's simple. It, <laughs> It's a 13-year-old grain after all, so 
a bit of a tannic note on the finish along with that sort of masking alcohol. Um, let's put a little drop of water with it and see what that does to it. Right now that emphasises the wine cask, a lot more wine cask now, a lot more red fruits, um, nice subtle spices, it's kind of more noticeable and, and there's less of the, the sort of grain spirit but it's still there, I mean it's still got that sort of slightly nippy herbally kind of note. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's okay. It's not not bad. I mean I'm not going to sort of say it's the greatest whiskey I've ever tasted in my life. Um, but it's it's it is what it is, I suppose. Let's see what the bar's like. Yeah, a bit like the nose. A bit more heavier on the wine cask. Subtler on the um, uh, the well the spirit character I should say um, softer now now it's put a little drop of water with it fuller slightly more um, syrupy I guess um, yeah it's a solid whiskey at the end of the day it's not bad at all um, so yeah nice starter right okay so on to the mask of death uh, Dalu and aged and virgin oak and first fill bourbon that's a really herbal nose. Um, it, it reminds me very much of a New World Sauvignon Blanc. It's that sort of big um, white fruits, almost estuary, cat pea, uh, gooseberry, green gauge, a little bit of honey, some gristy notes, touch of vanilla. I mean, that's a lovely nose. Um, it's not quite as malty or as rich as I would associate with Dal Ewan. Um it's got some nice tannins there's a touch of almond there's a touch of tightness from the um, the virgin oak channel uh, channins a um, little bit of fern it's got some maltiness beneath it's got a vibrancy that is a, I mean that is a lovely nose that is very very nice um, I mean, saving on as a as a grape variety is probably not my most favoured white grape variety. Um, I do find it hard work. I guess is the wrong word, but it's just yeah. You know, I've got to be in the right mood for it, and I think I think I need to be in the right mood for this as well because it is very saving on. It's very grassy. It's very cat pee. Um, but it's very impressive, nevertheless. It has to be said. Let's see what the powers are. Fuller, more vanilla, more oak on the palate. Toffee, coffee, no, not coffee, toffee. Um, but again, it's got that lovely kind of grassy spay character. Um, citrus, bitter, uh, herbal, kind of ferny notes. Um, again, there's some lovely weight there. There's some maltiness beneath that. It's really well balanced. Um, it's quite long. I don't think it needs any water. Um, the alcohol gives it a little bit of a tingle on the finish. There's a little bit of barley coming through on the end, a bit of lemon, ginger, almost ginger biscuits. Um, that's a lovely malt. That's beautiful. Recommended retail of 62.95. Yes, I know there's going to be some, uh, you know, drawn in breath, but come on. I mean, you know, we are in this, you know, 50 odd quid for a you know a distillery 10 year old take into account the uh the slightly more expensive virgin oak casks and yeah i i can live with that i mean 62.95 i'm happy with that um i know a lot of people would probably sort of like go as i said but you know you have to kind of get with the program these days um <laughs> yeah anyway good whiskey that one yeah, 
Right, okay. As you might have noticed, I have six glasses. The, <laughs> the glasses goblin actually returned the stolen glass. I mean, I was really surprised about that. Um, now all I need to do is convince the fairies to return everything. Anyway, let's move on to bottling number three. So this is the Nailed Puppet. And it is, like I said, Tormor aged in first and second um, uh, filled bourbon barrels. Now, you know, I mean, it's Tormor, isn't it? I mean, you know, Tormor is... I mean, you know, can you tell me what the characteristics of Tormor is? Yeah, all right, it's a sort of a lighty, sort of space id sort of... Um, but, you know, it's kind of... It's a bit nondescript, really. It's a bit of peach. There's a bit of, a bit of white fruit. There's a bit of honey. The oak makes it feel quite tight. Um, there's a touch of vanilla. But it's all... It's all sort of a bit so-so. And, I mean, I know... And I don't think it's a problem with the with the casks. Uh, certainly not. I don't think it's a problem with that. It's just Tormor at the end of the day. I mean, you know, when was the last time you tasted a Tormor that got you really excited? Can't think of one, but yeah, there may well have been one. But, you know, like I said, most Tormor is just Tormor, really, isn't it? Um, at best, sort of blending fodder, at, at worst, kind of. Just bloody innocuous, really. Um, I mean, this does have some character. I'll give it that. But it's sort of, you know, again, you know, we're looking at what we're looking at. Um, 65.95? Nah, not, not buying that one, it has to be said. Um, anyway, let's see what the power's like. Again, more oak on the palate, quite creamy. Bit of apricot, there's a bit of an edge there. Mm, almost burnt caramel, um, touch jarring, it has to be said. Um, touch of citrus, bit of spice. Um, again, don't think it really needs any water. I'm going to put a little drop of water with it just to see if something um, amazing actually happens to it. Um, being a bit harsh about this one, aren't I? Um, okay, it's emphasised the oak. It's a bit more honey, a um, bit more, a bit less of the sort of citrus character, but again, relatively nondescript, it has to be said. Let's see what the like that. More maltier, more oak less citrus um yeah i mean it's not a bad whiskey at all i mean you know i can't i can't pick faults with it i mean it is tormor at the end of the day it's not particularly exciting and it's certainly you know not the sort of whiskey i'd spend 65 quid on it has to be said but you know it is what it is Okay, so let's move on to the Blair Athol, the Dancing Cultist, 50.5%. Uh, let's see what the nose goes on this then, child. That's interesting. Um, unusual for Blair Athol. It's quite quite sharp. Um, brittle. Sort of brittle honey. Almost grain-like kind of dried fruit as well. It's, I mean, I'm, I mean, that's... I'm guessing the influence of the wine casks that's making it that sort of graininess, but that's really unusual. I mean, I don't think I've ever had a Blair Rathol that's quite like it. I mean, there's a little bit of spicy red fruit. There's a bit of youthfulness. There's that sort of biscuity, Weetabix kind of note in the background. There's a little bit of gooseberry coming through now. Um... I mean, I like the nose on this. Like I said, it's kind of quite unusual for Blair Athol. And I'm a bit a bit of a sucker for a sort of, you know, a distillery bottle, well, a distillery that shows something a, a little bit unusual. Hence why I kind of quite like the Dal Ewan. Um, because again, it was kind of like showing me something that I wasn't entirely expecting from Dal Ewan, it has to be said. And, and I guess this falls into the same category. It's showing me something... Uh, that I wouldn't have naturally expected from um, uh, Blair Athol. I would have expected more more meaty, full maltiness. Um, yet it's showing me something completely different, which is unusual. Um, 
Anyway, let's see what pops up. Again, does feel very much like the grain whiskey. It's got that slightly high-toned dried fruit kind of character. Um, kind of kicks off a little bit with more of the winey red fruits. There's a touch of tannin that builds quite pleasantly on, on the mid palate. It again shows that slight youthful Weetabixy um, maltiness. Um, I suppose you could say that more of the distillery character is kind of coming through on the mid palate. Um, lovely length that the kind of the the sort of wine cask is returning it's got a lovely progression and again i go on about it a, an awful lot but it is something that you know i do look for in a whiskey and so yes it kind of kicks off with the oak um you get the distillery character come through in the mid palate and it returns to the oak on the finish so all in all um now this is 65.95 and i would be more than happy spending that on this as opposed to the tormor um this has got infinitely more character infinitely more complexity and infinitely more um, lovability, I think. Right, okay, so on to the Williamson, uh, the bloody sacrifice. Um, let's see what the uh, load gives us on this. Well, yep, that's Lefroig, isn't it? It's actually quite, quite peppery but for a Lefroig. Uh, I'm guessing that's the Amarone influence. The Amarone influence is quite subtle. It's in the background. It's giving you that winey red fruit note. Um, it's a lovely coastal astringency here. Medicinal peat, winey dried fruits, charred oak, more peat. It, gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Now, the elephant in the room is that it's over a hundred quid a bottle. I mean, you know, you're going, how much? I mean, but it's Lefroy for for goodness sake. I mean, it's right, you know, this is what would a 10 year old independently bottled Ardbeg cost you? I mean, damn sight more than 100 quid. I mean, yeah, all right, it's expensive, but has a bloody good nose, adds beautifully balanced, lots of distillery character, bit of the wine cask. Um, I mean, they yeah, are spot on, absolutely spot on. I mean, you know. Like I said, given what's his face, um, uh, Adam, Adam's background at uh, Murray McDavid, uh, you would have thought that he would um, know how to sort of uh, finish casks, or at least have a uh, be well versed in the finishing, shall we say, um, or the aging, shall we say, and just went when to pick them and uh, bottle these casks. I mean, because this is. They're bloody good. I mean, it really is. I mean, yeah, it's bloody expensive, but oh, I like this. Let's see what pass on. Oh, it's gorgeous. That is lovely. Um, kicks off with the winey dried red fruit, then we move into herbal peat, salt, um, coastal astringency, slight medicinal herbs, and then the finish is this lovely melange of um, dried fruit, coastal notes, menthol, medicinal herbal notes, peat, smoke, ah, oh, it's just, that's just bloody good. I mean, Right, it's ridiculously expensive, I will give you that, but oh, that's good. I mean, that is just a sensational whiskey, it has to be said. Beautifully balanced, lovely combination of cask and distillery character. I mean, you know, what's not to like about that? Right, okay, and on to the final whiskey of the day. This is the 11 year old Kalila, the Rusty Cauldron. Let's hope it doesn't smell like a rusty cauldron. Um, anyway, let's see what the nose goes. Okay, so the sherry is up first. Um, getting those, those sort of sherry dried fruits, malt, medicinal herbs, peat. A little bit of a whininess in the background there, whiny red fruits. Um, 
that's a lovely balanced nose again lots of complexity distillery character different cast types getting all of that and that's it's not kind of like a morass it's not like a, a sort of a mess um, it's one of those sort of whiskies you stick your nose in the glass and you pick up something new and again all right this is not cheap it's cheaper than the um uh, the williamson it's 90 well, well the recommended retail price is 94.95 and you're going no that's a shitload for a bloody kalila and um yeah it does kind of make me wonder why is kalila sort of both ends of the spectrum why can you get relatively expensive i mean yeah all right so the lafitte casks are going to have cost you know a bit of money shall we say i mean you know um but you know what that's lovely i really like the nose on this um it's balanced and what more can you ask for let's see what that's like Oh, that's a lovely ashy, intense finish. Again, kicks off with the distillery character, that sort of smoky peat. Um, a little bit of sherry dried fruit, a little bit of winey red fruit, um, prune, sultana, almond. I mean, that's just mm, mm, unctuous, really full, really long, really complex. Again, I'm getting the distillery character and the elements of the two cast types and so that's just that's just really well put together um i can't say anything more than that really i'm impressed with the juice uh it has to be said and i'm more than happy with that and um certainly a certain uh um uh, whiskey uh, emporium will be um putting these on the shelves and uh, a certain sort of taste in the evening may well actually feature one or possibly more of these particular bottlings because some of these, I mean, that is bloody good. I mean, yes, it's expensive, I know, but this is the this is the kind of the, the the universe we're living in now you know it's like you know we we ain't in kansas anymore toto as they say God, can i get any more metaphors in <gasps> hmm. okay so let's sum today's episode of the show firstly a big thank you to everyone at uh, brave new spirits for the samples for today's episode of the show um i hope you think that i've done them justice i think you know i think i've given them a a, a fair kind of uh, crack of the whip shall we say um that's a an idea for a, for uh for a bottling isn't it the crack of the whip um um maybe um no uh so on the whole, I, I really think the juice has lived up to the, 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 the marketing and the labelling, um, which is I'm, I'm really relieved about, it has to be said, because the last thing you want to do is sort of like go, wow, really love these these labels and love this concept, love all of this, and then you taste the whiskey and you think, dear God, what the hell is this? Um, I mean, there's one or two that, you know, I'm less enamoured by, I mean, you know, I mean, even so, I mean, the Coven of uh, Destruction, still a lovely bottling. Yeah, not quite complex enough, not quite interesting enough to sort of, you know, really sort of pique my interest. Um, but, you know, quality bottling nevertheless. Um, the Mask of Death, like I said, um, always intrigued by bottlings that show a different side to a distillery and this is the lovely thing about the independent sector um, they get to sort of show you know the distillery doesn't want you to have this kind of bottling because the distillery obviously wants a continuity of style um, and anything that sort of breaks the mold in essence um, is not what they're looking for and so you know when you get something from an independent that does this it really is you know, um, ticking all my boxes. Um, the Tormor, um, the uh, the nail puppet. Well, again, I can't argue with the quality of it. It is very Tormor. Um, it's a bit, frankly, a bit dull. But then that's kind of Tormor for you, isn't it? Really, at the end of the day. Um, the the dancing cultist, uh, the Blair Athol. Like I said, with the Dal Ewan. It's always lovely to see. You know, something slightly different from a distillery. Um, that, that kind of like goes against its grain to a certain extent 
um, and so yeah I'm really really impressed by that um, the uh, the bloody sacrifice uh, yeah beautiful bottling uh, probably my favorite bottling of the range um, yes it's expensive but you know uh, I, I honestly think that that's kind of, that is worth it and I would sell it at that kind of money and the dance um, the uh, rusty cauldron again you know expensive for what it is I will grant you that but really think it's worth it and if you're prepared to shell out the money I really don't think you would be disappointed by the end result so on the whole pretty positive really impressed by what they're doing looking forward to presenting their other range um, the, the rebels next week um, but until then I, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the show uh, if you are a new viewer and just started watching the channel please uh, click the subscribe button that's always very very much appreciated and as are your comments so until next week um, Good drumming and good afternoon.